I, I guess uh, I'll just I'll just jump right in. Uh, the, the ocean is important. I don't really need to, to justify that uh, to most folks, but obviously it's a source of food. Uh, we get a lot of new health um, medicine biomolecule complexes from the ocean. Uh, it's a great place. Tons of biodiversity. We can obtain hints to to our past climate and even life on other planets, and I'm, that's actually not my specialty, but that is uh, Dr. Gabrielli's specialty. Um, and then finally, it's an Earth system filter. For the most part, you could throw something in the ocean and you're not gonna see it for a thousand years. As uh, sad as that is, um, it's a really good filter for, for removing things that might be detrimental to uh, our health or our ecosystem at the surface uh, of the ocean or on land. So chemical oceanography is, is fundamentally interdisciplinary. It's chemistry and it's oceanography, but it's really hard to, to bin things in specific fields. Um, for instance, I'm working with Dr. Gabrielli right now, as he said, to develop an ice borehole analyzer, and that really falls on the chemical side of things, but we're borrowing an instrument that we use in chemical oceanography to do this. So there's fundamental research and there's applied research. And this is something that you don't really realize until you start doing research. It didn't really hit me only until a couple of years ago that when I was in graduate school, I was doing primarily National Science Foundation fundamental research, looking at molecular reactions and kinetic rates, uh, how iron oxides were being solubilized by, by bacteria. You know, not very useful on the surface for much, but nonetheless, when we take that information and then we actually apply it to something like uh, bioremediating uranium at uh, enrichment sites from World War II, now we're talking applied research. And uh, really what we end up doing, or at least what I end up doing, is whatever pays the bills. So. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a sad fact about doing science, but at the same time, um, it's also nice because if you dream it, you can do it. That's actually my last bullet point on the slide. Um, chemical oceanography is great for engaging students with uh, STEM research. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then lastly, it's it's fun. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. We tend to work hard, play hard. Um, you get to see the world when you do field work, and uh, we go to conferences, and, and we tack travel onto the end of our conferences. For instance, I was this past week I was out in Portland, Oregon, at the Ocean Sciences Meeting, which is the biggest oceanography conference in the world, and uh, we went skiing afterwards. Uh, me and a couple of my colleagues is sort of a tradition, and we, you know, we we went skiing for a couple of days, and then we stumbled upon a Coolio concert. So, I mean, if you want to talk about fun, um, and this all wouldn't happen unless we were actually traveling for work. Uh, with oceanography, you get to connect with your colleagues while at sea, but you can also disconnect. You don't have cell phones. Uh, you get used to it after a couple days. It's pretty good for you. Um, it's work that you feel good about, and you have uh, a lot of job freedom as a uh, professor. Um, but you do have this nagging, guilty feeling uh, when you're not working. People tell me that the longer you stay in the field, the less that actually is a thing. Um, so we'll see. And then I already mentioned the last point. So I'll just get into the, the fundamental background stuff first, like I said, before I get into the, the fun stuff. Uh, so I need to introduce elemental cycling. And basically what we're trying to do in chemical oceanography for, for the most part is, oops, can you guys see my mouse? Of course you can. Yeah. That's good, because I can point to things. What we're trying to do is measure the concentrations in any given reservoir, you know, coastal ocean, deep ocean. We can multiply that by the reservoir size and come up with the number of moles of a specific compound. And then from that, you can get grams or pedigrams. And then we can start talking about transfer within these different reservoirs within the ocean, but also inputs from, say, the atmosphere or land as well. Why does it keep doing that? So when we start talking about uh, this transport, we need to also think about uh, reactions and from that fluxes and, and how do we measure fluxes 
Uh, reactions are governed by thermodynamics, which then govern kinetics. So these are also things that we consider a lot. We're looking at the size distribution of uh, chemical compounds. Mostly for chemical oceanography, we're looking at things less than a micron. And then we have these operationally defined uh, um, partitions. Basically, anything particulate will not pass through a 200 nanometer filter. Anything dissolved will. And then sort of more new age work, we're now uh, distinguishing but dissolved between soluble or nanoparticulate and colloidal. Um, the main difference being these things are, are truly small and truly bioavailable, while colloidal things are almost like miniature particles. But for the most part, this dissolved stuff can actually transport long distances when the ocean, it were in, in the ocean, but particulates, on the other hand, are just going to settle out. So there's big differences in bioavailability. Uh, we talk about phases, solids, liquids, gases. Gases aren't necessarily dissolved or you know, based on Henry's law, they can either remain in the gas phase like bubbles or they can actually dissolve within uh, within uh, the, the, the water. Of course, chemical form. And then lastly, uh, a lot of the work we do centers around developing new methods. And a lot of these methods are in situ, meaning we actually put an instrument in the ocean. The instrument measures stuff directly, and then we get the instrument back, or the instrument transfers the data remotely via uh, cell phone networks or satellites. What tools do we use? Well, obviously research vessels, which can cost anywhere between $2,000 and $100,000 a day. Um, typically, you're talking ten dollars or $12,000 for a 100-foot boat with a crew of, of six or, or eight. Um, we use most common instrument will be a CTD rosette. Here you have your rosette with uh, an attached CTD, which is measuring conductivity, temperature, and depth. And you have these Niskin bottles that you can actually trigger at different depths as you load this or as you lower this CTD into the ocean. Uh, there's other types of bottles, for instance, these majors samples or samplers. These are actually made out of titanium. They're trace metal clean, and you could stick them into uh, hydrothermal vent fluid at 400 degrees Celsius. And these are what they use on the Alvin submarine, which I'll show you later. Uh, sediment cores, here's a single core. And then we have a multi-core with eight core barrels on it here, are full sediment cores. If you're in the abyssal plain of the ocean, 5,000 meter water depth, it takes about six hours to lower this thing and get it back. So you're talking about a lot of time just to obtain these sediments. They're almost worth their weight in, in gold, or, or at least silver or something. <laughs> you have uh, uh, in situ instruments, and there's a ton of them. I don't have time to go through them all, but for instance, uh, here's an in situ flux analyzer. And uh, uh, Dr. Gabrielli, you may recognize this as a uh, eddy correlation uh, device, because we borrowed this, oceanographers, we borrowed this from uh, meteorologists and atmospheric scientists. Essentially, uh, what you have here is uh, two components. So one thing that's measuring oxygen right here, and it's measuring oxygen very fast. And then you have a, an, a, an acoustic Doppler current velocity profiler, an ADCP, which is actually measuring the current also very fast associated with that little particle of seawater. So now you can tell if that seawater particle is entering into the sediments or leaving the sediments, and you could sort of integrate over time to obtain information about fluxes of oxygen in this case. And I'll explain why, that, why that's important soon. Uh, lots of other in situ instruments, again, that I don't have time to explain. Uh, oh, and here's an example of biofouling. This is just a CTD uh, left for a month or two at our dock over in Sarasota at my old uh, position. And, um, you know, we're always fighting with, with biofouling. So from an elemental perspective, the elements that I've highlighted here um, tend to be the main ones that we focus on. Uh, occasionally, there's some uh, some Flyers, you know, some somebody will propose something to go study neodymium isotopes or something. But for the most part, most of the research is related to these elements. And I'm just going to break it up now into the major ions. So cations and anions, these are the most abundant uh, ions in seawater. 
Uh, other major redox analytes, whoops, what did I just do? Major redox analytes, things that are associated with carbon and carbon cycling. Trace metals, which can be either toxic or they can be nutrients in smaller quantities. So you have these this first row of transition elements, uh, some cadmium, mercury, arsenic, selenium, even aluminum. And notice aluminum and iron, some of these appear on, on multiple in multiple categories. Macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and silicon. And then finally, things that are mixing tracers. And these actually allow us to trace mixing between, say, land processes and seawater processes. For instance, if you see radium in your seawater sample, that pretty much indicates that you have groundwater coming from land to sea um, in your sample. And then take that even a step further, you can actually look at isotopes of radium or, or radon, uh, thorium, and, this could, and you can actually derive rates. You can tell, well, how long ago did this water parcel actually flux from land to sea. So there are basically all these categories that I just showed. There's people that specialize um, within them, and, and you know there's a few other categories, but I don't really have time to go through them all. So really, what controls uh, the abundance of things in the ocean? On the left side, you see abundance of things in the Earth's crust. And what you see is oxygen and silicon are, are certainly the highest. Uh, they're in silicate minerals, aluminum and aluminum and alumina silicates and iron also in the same uh, type of minerals. Silicates are 90% of Earth's crust. And then you have all these other cations that could actually coordinate and sort of tuck into one of these alumina silicate or, or clay minerals. Now in seawater, on the other hand, of course you have oxygen and hydrogen H2O first, and but then you have you don't have silicon, aluminum, or iron. What you have are the salts that I mentioned, uh, the major cations and anions. You see some, you see carbon, and you see your nutrients, silicon, nitrogen, phosphorus, but you don't see the aluminum and iron that were numbers three and four in the crust. You don't see them uh, until all the way at the bottom in seawater. And the reason for this, and it's a huge problem for, for, for life in the ocean, is that these minerals in an oxidizing environment are extremely, extremely insoluble. So in an oxidizing environment, I don't know why that keeps happening, but in an oxidizing environment, uh, your iron, for instance, is going to be in the ferric iron form, the plus three state, and when it does that, it's going to immediately attract hydroxyl uh, ions. It's going to actually strip them away from water, and you're going to form uh, iron hydroxides, a.k.a. rust. And this rust is going to sink out, and uh, your microbes and, and your phytoplankton that need this iron as a nutrient are not going to be able to have it. So, um, yeah, uh, what I'll get into now is, is uh, rock weathering, which really explains why we have those cations uh, and anions um, in the ocean. And the salinity of the ocean is primarily because of this rock weathering processes. And, and this over geological time scales also regulates carbon dioxide concentrations. So this is a, a little plot that I stole um, from this website and I added the stuff in red here. And essentially what happens on land is you have rock weathering of carbonate minerals. So your carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid, which then reacts with calcium carbonates. And you get this compound here, but you can break that up into calcium ions, calcium plus two, and then a couple of bicarbonate ions. So now you're adding bicarbonate to the ocean, you're adding calcium ions to the ocean, and you're removing carbon dioxide from the ocean. Uh, same thing happens with silicate mineral weathering. Uh, in this case, you have a magnesium silicate, which is olivine, reacts with, again, with carbon dioxide uh, in water through rain. Now you get magnesium ions, again, which were a large com constituent of seawater. You generate some bicarbonate and now uh, silicic acid. And uh, these, essentially, these, all these components end up going from the mountains to the water. 
And now you end up with um, with some with with the with these different yeah you, you end up with with the different constituents of seawater, and now you have to think about those are the the long term components of the carbon cycle uh, at least um, the the natural carbon cycle, and now what happens is you overlay this short term life these photosynthesis and respiration processes which happen you know on the order of of days or weeks or months. Uh, as opposed to these things that happen uh, over, you know, hundreds of millions of years. And for the most part, photosynthesis and respiration are equivalent. So any time you actually can, you, you, your plants take carbon dioxide and they convert it to um, formaldehyde, this is just what we use as a, as a simple representation of organics. This is the simplest organic molecule in existence. We're sort of, we are simplifying here. Um, that organic matter, you have now removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the surface ocean, and now it sinks when these organisms die or when they poop. And now this, uh, this organic matter ends up in the surface sediments. And for the most part, now you have bacteria that actually use this organic matter and they respire it. So they've reversed this process. They've reversed, they've reversed this carbon sequestration process and they're releasing the CO2 back into the ocean it could go back into the atmosphere. However, some of this organic matter does not get remineralized. Some of it can actually sink, and it avoids getting eaten by microbes. And then it ends up in the sediments, and eventually it can actually get subducted and enter the mantle, and then it's gone for hundreds of millions of years. So this is the only way that we can actually permanently remove carbon, or carbon dioxide from the Earth's system is by burial and sediments. And this is important for what I'm, for, for really what I focus on. And a lot of my research focuses on uh, carbon cycling. Basically, how much of this carbon is, escapes remineralization, uh, and what are the pathways by which this carbon gets eaten when it actually enters the sediments. And so, uh, by a show of hands, who has heard of sediment diagenesis? One. One person. All right, so this is really uh, interesting to me because sediment diagenesis is what got me interested into oceanography. And yet, it is, it, I feel like it's so powerful in getting people involved, and yet it's never taught. So that's why I'm proud to teach you about sediment diagenesis. And essentially, what it means is, is what happens to this organic carbon when it hits the sediments. And so let's take a typical uh, coastal environment your organic carbon sediments, um, and here I'm going to show a few of these concentration profiles. Imagine this is the first 20 centimeters of the surface sediments, and then over here is the higher concentration. So for oxygen, your bottom waters of your ocean are generally ox or oxic. You have uh, they're saturated with oxygen, and now your um, your organic carbon is degraded. So microbes are smart, just like you and me, who we, we use oxygen to breathe because we get the most energy out of it. It's the most efficient. Microbes can actually do the same thing. So the best, strongest microbes will live in the surface, but they will run out of oxygen very soon because this oxygen can't be replenished as fast as it's used up, especially if you're dealing with muddy sediments with very low permeabilities. So below the zone of oxygen, the organisms will then use the next most uh, energetically favorable terminal electron acceptors, uh, essentially things that, that they can strip an electron off of organic carbon and dump it onto these oxidized things. And in turn, they actually reduce these different things. Uh, and I say reduce as in uh, an electrochemical sense. So for instance, uh, the next thing to go is nitrate reduction or denitrification, and then after that, uh, your iron oxides are actually reduced to iron two. And you'll see, because iron two, it's it is soluble. It's not like iron oxide. The reduced form of iron can actually accumulate in sediment pool waters here. So we're looking at dissolved things here. Uh, and this 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 iron too if if you don't if you're not in an area with a lot of iron oxide deposition essentially this zone will be pretty small but then you'll end up with sulfate reduction 
and you've all probably been to the beach or in a marsh or something and you've lifted mud out of the of the uh, out of the sediments and you smell it and it smells pretty bad and that's because of sulfate reduction essentially you have a bunch of sulfate in seawater but that sulfate is reduced to sulfide when uh, when it run when you run out of oxygen nitrate iron and manganese oxides and this sulfide can actually be toxic to things like seagrass so in these environments where you have sulfate reduction and sulfide accumulation you may not have the healthiest seagrass. You won't have the deeply rooted, strong seagrass uh, if we're talking about, a, in particular, an estuary environment. Now, on the other hand, if you do have a lot of iron oxide deposition, and this is really what my research focuses on, if you have a lot of iron oxide deposition, you will have a much larger zone of iron reduction, and you'll keep sulfide at bay. Essentially, sulfate reduction is not thermodynamically favorable while you, st while you still have iron oxides around. Uh, so iron reduction will dominate. Sulfate reduction, will you'll keep it at bay. And in doing so, you'll also solubilize some iron oxides. And when I say solubilize, I mean not only as iron-2, but also as iron-3. But I just told you, I said iron-3 is extremely insoluble. It's going to form oxide precipitates. So what am I talking about? Well. If you chelate the iron with organic molecules, you can actually keep it in solution. So we actually do generate some of this organic iron-3, which can then flux out of sediments and provide a limiting nutrient to um, other, or, to, or for primary production uh, in the surface ocean. So kind of switching gears, but I'll come back to that. The fundamental chemical variables that we study pretty much every oceanographic adventure you go on, you're going to measure salinity temperature, CDOM, which is colored dissolved organic matter, chlorophyll A, and backscatter, which is essentially turbidity, which is a measure of your particles. Uh, we need salinity temperature for circulation modeling. Salinity is not too easy to measure, though. Um, normally, we report salinity in, in PSU, which is essentially something that we just determine via conductivity measurements. Uh, there's other ways, including a newer standard that I only learned about while putting this presentation together, but uh, the, they're really making a push to start using this. So that's something I'm going to look into. Now, CDOM, chlorophyll A, and backscatter are all measured optically. So here would just be a, a SOND, S-O-N-D-E. This is a device that we would actually dip in the water, and each one of these things here is a different sensor, oxygen sensor, uh, salinity, temperature, all these things. And um, it's important to measure these guys, and I'll explain why here. A different, another subfield within oceanography is organic geochemistry. So that's everything that's not inorganic. So organic geochemistry is anything that contains carbon, and usually if you think about the organics in seawater, you're going to have a mixture of proteins, amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates, and humic substances. Humic substances are molecules that look like this. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of different individual humic molecules. And they are operationally defined. Uh, well, actually, let me, let me back up a little bit. They are undefined individually. Basically, we can't go out and measure 100,000 different kinds of molecules. So instead, we use bulk techniques. We'll take a sample uh, of our organics in seawater and we'll actually look at, for instance, how they absorb light as a function of wavelength. And you could see here, uh, this was a cool slide that I came across yesterday putting this presentation together, but look how different when you soak some maple leaves in water, look at how different the color is versus some fern leaves. So naturally, these things, when they end up being transferred from land to sea, as you can see here, they're going to absorb a lot of light. And they absorb more light than anything else in the ocean. So they're very important um, from an optical perspective, from a heat transfer perspective, uh, and from a, a metal chelation perspective. See these little carboxylic acid functional groups right here? These things are going to bind to metals and keep them in solution. So they're very, very, very important for uh, bio, keeping things bioavailable, uh, keeping nutrients bioavailable, especially trace metals.
So chemical ecology is another subfield. Uh, this is something I worked on a lot of my older physician and, and especially now too, and I'll explain why. The red field ratio is it's a well-established ratio between the nutrient needs of an organism, the big three macronutrients, nitrogen, silicon, phosphorus, relative to carbon. And if you look in phytoplankton, for the most part, you're always going to see this ratio, the deep ocean the same way, but not in the surface ocean and coast because these regions are too dynamic. Anytime something's coming off of land, it's going to, anytime a nutrient's coming off of land, it's going to be quickly acquired by an organism, by, by a primary producer of phytoplankton, and it's going to consume it and turn it into life. What is wrong, computer? Um, so we end up with problems like eutrophication. You probably, most of you have probably heard of the Mississippi dead zone. Uh, you have nutrients coming from farmland, and then the nutrients end up coming out of the Mississippi River. Stop that. And the, these nutrients lead to excess primary production. You have less light penetration, less photosynthesis in turn, and more respiration when all of these phytoplankton essentially die and sink to the bottom. And now you consume all your oxygen. So you have a dead zone at the bottom of these sediments or close to these sediments, there's no oxygen and there's no uh, oxygen breathing life forms like fish that can actually live there. And this is a seasonal example. It comes during the summertime when you have bad rains. Uh, on the other hand, you could have algae blooms, not just that decrease oxygen, but also that produce harmful toxins. And the saltwater species, what I studied on the west coast of Florida was Karenia brevis or Florida red tide, which you see here. There's some bad ones up in the Gulf of Maine, and there's also one that ruined the entire um, Dungeness crab uh, fishing season off of the coast of California a few years ago. And then you guys are probably familiar with microcystis blooms, which were in Lake Erie and actually caused uh, 500,000 people to go without drinking water. We have the same blooms actually where I now live and, and work in the Indian River Lagoon. And you say, well, that's freshwater. Why are you talking about it? Well, because freshwater is less dense than seawater. So you can have these surface lenses on the top of seawater and the top of estuaries that can actually support these uh, these species, even though they're in the ocean or in a saline estuary. So uh, iron as a nutrient, well, this is my element. This is what I study. Uh, I almost got a tattoo of, of iron at one point. <laughs> like I said, there's this bioavailability paradox where iron, too, if you're in an acidic mine draining, sure, your iron, too, can stay in solution. But in the ocean, it forms rust. And there's these things called band in iron formations. Maybe Paulo has talked about them, but I'm not going to. Uh, there's these regions of the oceans that are called high nutrient, low chlorophyll, or HNLC regions, where you have a lot of um, a, a lot of like the Southern Ocean, or there's regions in the Pacific Ocean where you have a lot of macronutrients, nitrogen, silica, and phosphorus, but you don't have any iron. And it was only a couple decades ago that people realized, wow, if you actually add iron to these regions, you could stimulate phytoplankton blooms. People actually dumped a bunch of iron sulfate and iron filings into the ocean and saw bloom. And, you know, now the sources are, are really highly contested, especially out in the open ocean. If iron comes from land, how do you get it out in the open ocean? Well, maybe via dust, right? Um, and uh, closer to land, or, or actually it's, it's really being realized uh, now in this, in this cool paper that came out last year that indeed input from sediments is much more important than previously realized. And, and that's, what, that's what me and my colleagues have been telling the, the community, the scientific community for years, and now they're just finally believing us. So we kind of want to say, told you so. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, last thing, last slide, how much time do I have? Um, sorry. That wasn't the best way to do this. 20 minutes or? 20 minutes? Or, yeah. Okay. If you need more, you, we have even more minutes. It depends how much questions. Okay. This is uh, the last slide before I get to the fun stuff. Thanks for, for bearing with me, everybody. Um, 
Ocean observing is this buzzword, and it's something that I was introduced to on, in the, when I was part of the Gulf of Mexico scientific community with the oil spill and with all the economy or, or the commerce in the Gulf of Mexico. Having observations of the ocean and having real-time observations of the ocean is really important. So like I said earlier, in situ data, so devices like buoys that are collecting data and transmitting remotely via satellite back to shore to these sort of services that are sort of aggregating this data, almost like a weather service, uh, something like IUSE, which is a NOAA, a National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration service, um, you know, they, they're actually funding a lot of ocean observing research. And their main reason is because traditional sampling costs a lot of money and real-time data can actually help save lives. For instance, imagine um, a, a, a call to the Coast Guard, somebody went overboard or something and they're lost. We need better current prediction. We didn't know where the water is going. Uh, and in fact, the Coast Guard says that if they have accurate current prediction, they have a three times better chance of rescuing somebody. So it helps save, save lives. It helps save money from a shipping perspective. Uh, there's a very fast pace of technology development, so it's hard to keep up. Um, and, you know, I, I probably interact more with government organizations than I'd like to. Um, notice here, I'll talk about this later, here's an, an autonomous underwater vehicle, an underwater drone. Uh, that's something I'll, I'll have a few funny anecdotes about. So really, I'll switch gears now. Thanks for bearing with me. Here is my story as a chemical oceanographer. Uh, that's just a picture of my niece. It has nothing to do with this talk at all, but she's just absolutely adorable, and I get to see her this weekend, so I'm excited. Um, I did my undergrad degree at Georgia Tech, and I did undergrad research. Essentially, my uh, who ended up being my PhD advisor, he, he asked, he sent an email around to the department asking who wanted to do undergrad research, work on some NASA project, go on oceanographic research cruises, and how could I not say hell yeah to that? So uh, I signed up for that, ended up doing some work as an undergrad uh, over a summer, and then through the next year until I eventually signed up for a master's program, and I was bribed to stick around for a PhD. Uh, he held a, my, my PhD advisor held this carrot in front of my face that I'd get to dive on this submersible submarine, the Alvin, if I stuck around. Um, and then I, after uh, my PhD, I obtained a postdoc over on the west coast of Florida in Sarasota at Moat Marine Lab, became program manager of ocean technology program after a year or so, and continued to do that for a couple of years. And now I'm finally a, an academic uh, faculty member over at Harbor Branch. Um, what's interesting is working at a nonprofit is there's a lot of donors. So that place, a lot of research was funded by donors. So we always went to fancy gala events and, you know, it's just different than being in an, in an academic or, or in, in, a, in a university environment. You know, we got to go fishing a lot on smaller boats and um, it wasn't always fun. We had to do a lot of climbing onto uh, towers covered in, in bird poop and the stench is just absolutely nauseating when you go up there. Um, you know, there's fancy pictures it was in magazines and, and newspaper advertisements all the time. Um, you know, just a different environment being at a nonprofit. That's just a cool picture of a crab that took shelter in, in something that I don't, I don't know what that actually is, but it's kind of cool. Um, so, in, as an undergrad, I learned this technique that has really sort of created, it's carved out a niche for me uh, in chemical oceanography. Essentially, what we use is something called mercury voltammetry, and we make these electrodes, and essentially at these electrodes, at the tip of these electrodes, if you zoom in, if we're looking at the bottom of this electrode, there's a little tiny 100 micron diameter gold wire, and I actually cover that in elemental mercury, and then this mercury, this mercury can actually mediate the reactions between all of those different redox species that I mentioned before that we see in sediments. So here you see four of these electrodes here uh, attached to this manifold that is going to slowly penetrate the sediments and measure uh, 
electrochemically, it's going to take electrochemical scans at each different depth. And from that, we can actually obtain a vertical picture, like I showed earlier, that vertical picture of the concentrations of these different profiles or these different chemical analytes as a function of depth. With voltammetry, we scan a range of potentials, and at individual potentials, we know that these different species, these different chemical analytes, are going to react. They're going to undergo an, an oxidation reduction reaction, and we see a spike in current, which is proportional to the concentration of that species. So here it is in lab form, but we've also done it in situ uh, and in sediment cores. Now, we make these other uh, electrodes out of uh, peak plastic, so they're really robust. We can stick them anywhere we want. We've actually placed these in the hydrothermal vents before because they can withstand the high temperature and pressure. And here you see I've put those electrodes in these little soda can size reactors. This was my undergraduate research. I spent a summer and then some actually incubating bacteria that respire iron, bacteria that can somehow breathe rust. Uh, with an organic carbon source, lactate, here are these bacteria here adhering to, to iron oxides, and then looking at the molecular mechanism by which these bacteria can actually breathe rust. They can eat carbon but breathe rust. And we saw over time that these bacteria, what they do is they actually secrete an organic compound that goes out and dissolves the iron oxides, chelating the iron, now you have this organic iron-3 that's formed, and this is truly soluble. So this can actually pass through the cell membranes. Unlike the iron oxides, you know, how, how do you actually get a solid mineral through a cell membrane? It's impossible. So this is actually what we determine how these bugs are doing this. Now uh, we get into the fun stuff. Did a lot of salt marsh work in, um, in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, working at the Skidaway Institute of Oceanography, which is a University of Georgia um, entity. They're actually our, our arch enemy since we're Georgia Tech, they're University of Georgia, but regardless, we'll, we'll use their facilities. And, uh, we wanted to know why, we wanted to look at carbon retention within salt marshes. So all this carbon comes from land and it gets filtered through the salt marshes and a lot of it gets buried. So unlike the deep ocean where you don't have much carbon burial, it all gets remineralized on the seafloor, in salt marshes, you actually do have a lot of carbon burial. So we wanted to know, again, how much of that carbon is buried and how much of it is turned back into, how much of it is eaten and how much of that carbon is breathed back out by these microbes. And so we had, uh, we would take sediment cores and get super muddy doing it. It's a lot of fun. I mean. Maybe it's an acquired taste, but I certainly enjoyed it. We, you know, we, we really do have a lot of fun doing it. We also uh, put those electrochemical analyzer setups on a benthic lander, and we would put that down on the sediments and let it sit there for uh, overnight or a couple of days, and these electrodes would analyze uh, the mud. Now I'm going to talk about uh, this life on the research vessel Savannah, and I think I've spent over 200 days of my life on this research vessel. So, you know, the crew, they're like family to me. Um, when you're working on a research vessel, this is an, a 93-foot boat. You have, you have long days and nights. Because it's so expensive, you don't really work, you know, from 8 to 5 or whatever. You're working around the clock, and you're lucky if you get five or six hours of sleep um, every night, you know, for a week in this case. You don't have a cell phone once you get offshore. Uh, you run out of fresh vegetables, and you know you get the scurvy, vitamin C deficiencies. Uh, there's no comfortable area on a boat. Notice here, this is the um, this is actually where we eat, uh, and then this is the living room area. Notice the awesome television and the comfortable bench seats. This is actually the most comfortable room on the entire ship besides your bunk. So, you know, it's not exactly a, a luxury liner. Uh, you get seasick, there's lots of loud noises and diesel fumes, and best of all, you're never more than 93 feet away from your colleagues. So that gets really awesome after a few weeks. Uh, on the plus side, you have good espresso, and I only realized uh, 
took me a while to realize why my PhD advisor kept, I thought he was so nice giving us espressos all the time, but really he just wanted to get more work out of us. That's all it amounted to. Um, you have unlimited ice cream at sea and you get a lot of hip flexor exercise from balancing. You know, we have fun painting buoys, uh, shrimping, or this is shrimping, this is oysters. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of fun stuff as well. We went out on the RV Savannah to the Satilla River in South Georgia. Uh, we were looking at how iron was released from sediments. So as a product of this organic carbon degradation, remember I said you produce this truly soluble, organically complex iron three. Well, how is it produced and how much of it is produced? And so for a few years, we would actually go every couple of months on a one week long cruise and we would deploy this in situ benthic lander, uh, like I showed before, like the one we used in the salt marsh, um, except this one also has a benthic chamber, which you can kind of see here. And what the benthic chamber does, and you can also see it here, oops, is it forms an enclosed parcel of water above the sediments. It actually sinks into the sediments and you have a little enclosed cylindrical volume above the sediments. You can monitor the concentrations of different analytes in that water parcel over time. So if you have any inputs from the sediment, if you know the volume of this little parcel of water and you know how the concentration is changing over time, you can infer a flux from the sediments. So that's a neat way uh, that's been used for a long time to measure sediment fluxes. Um, you know, it's not as cool as the eddy correlation technique that I explained earlier, but with eddy correlation, you're, all, you're limited to sensors that have a very fast reaction time on the order of less than 200 milliseconds. So we can't use it for all different analytes. So for instance, for iron, we use uh, this benthic chamber. We also uh, put the same instrument package on a deep sea benthic lander. Now this one doesn't have a rope attached to it. This one has these floats attached to it. And then in these little buckets here, we actually put uh, scrap metal. So this thing, when we deploy it, it first sinks to the seafloor. It takes a while for it to sink, especially if the water's deep. And it will take measurements. It'll take samples over time using syringes from this benthic chamber. It also has this electrochemical uh, profiler on it with those glass electrodes I showed. And after a day or two, it'll drop. It's programmed to burn a wire right here in this little carriage. It burns this wire and you drop the weight buckets. And now the whole lander is light again and it floats to the surface and it calls home uh, using a GPS beacon. And so we can actually then track it um, until we can't. And so we lost the lander twice, and you know this thing cost uh, about as much as a as a as a really nice BMW, right? And so one time we deployed it right here off the coast of Cape Lookout, North Carolina, and it was kind of a stupid thing to do because we knew that a storm was coming. But because cruises are so expensive, you know, you're trying to get as many analyses in as possible. You may be rushing things. And uh, essentially, it didn't pop up when it was supposed to. It was supposed to pop up after 24 hours, but it didn't. So eventually the storm came and we had no choice but to head back into to port for the night. And when we came back, we didn't know what we were gonna do, but we were hoping that it surfaced. And um, we actually went and looked for it on the depth finder, but we didn't see it. And we said, uh-oh, it's gone. Something happened to it. And then all of a sudden we start getting reports and that's what these little dots are. We started getting reports from the satellite uh, modem, the satellite beacon. And by the time it got caught in the Gulf Stream current. And by the time we actually picked this thing up, it had drifted a few hundred miles and we wasted about four days, two in transit there and two in transit back to retrieve this thing. So we learned our lesson not to rush things. Um, yeah, uh, well, that was that was actually the second time we lost the lander. The first time we lost the lander, we lost we lost it. It was gone. <laughs> we had to explain to National Science Foundation 
or at least my PhD advisor did, um, why uh, or you know what happened. And you know it's kind of understood. It's it's you're doing very difficult things at the bottom of the ocean. It's not unreasonable to lose something like that. Just don't do it twice. So now um, the uh, what time did I start? 35, 25. I'm going on 50 minutes. Is that okay, Paulo? Yes. I mean, yeah. We have we have this time. Yeah. If okay. You can um, make a little bit shorter. Perhaps we have more time for questions as well. Okay. Yeah. Give me like give me like 10 more minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So um, this was really cool. I got to actually go on the RV Atlantis. Uh, you've seen the Alvin probably in Discovery Channel documentaries. You've also probably seen the Jason submarine. And um, it entailed going to study hydrothermal vents because we have these cool electrodes uh, that allow us to look at these reduced and oxidized analytes directly in the vent fluid. And it entailed going to Mexico, um, spending a month at sea, and every day at sea, the sub would actually be deployed, and there would be three people in the submarine, the pilot and two scientists, and you would disappear for about nine hours, head down to the seafloor, take some samples. This is actually a real image from my, um, from my uh, dive. And then uh, you get hazed. So there is hazing. It's still alive in oceanography. After your first Alvin dive, they end up dumping a, a minus 80 degree bucket of salt water. It's been in a minus 80 degree freezer uh, on you. And then they also filled my shoes with shaving cream for some reason and taped them up. I'm not really sure why they did that. Um, they put duct tape all around it and it says no open toed shoes on deck. And, you know, you play lots of ping pong while you're on board and you spend a long time, this is, you know, a month at sea, it's a long time, but you end up with some really, really cool hydrothermal vent samples. And, you know, it's, it's obviously a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, I say that, but at the same time, I still write proposals to try and get back down there, to try and get funded to go back out on, uh, on the Alvin submarine. Uh, some other deep sea work I did, this is, this is hands down the greatest time of my life. I can honestly say that my trip on this French research vessel, uh, the, the Navire Oceanographique, pourquoi pas, uh, the 40 days I spent out there over Christmas 2011 and, and New Year's um, was fantastic. We went out there to look at the Congo River Submarine Canyon. And the Congo River is the only river that's still directly connected to its submarine canyon. So you at the at the bottom of the seafloor offshore, 800 kilometers offshore of the uh, Congo River, you have this area where you have turbidite accumulation. And uh, to quote myself, which ended up uh, in a review paper, uh, you have a local. It's it's like you've transported a coastal sediment system to the deep sea, and you have all this iron-rich sediment, and you have all this weird life forms that can actually live in it, these, these uh, vesicose sulfide oxidizing clams. Um, you know, I met lifelong colleagues. And the thing is with French cruises, you have delicious food and um, you get to drink wine uh, at lunch and dinner, um, you know, and, and, and basically that's a big difference between American and European cruises. Uh, alcohol being allowed or not. So it does tend to add to the atmosphere. Again, you had uh, now in this case an equator crossing ceremony. Um, and uh, yeah, again, just, just a lot of fun. We did some work in the northern Gulf of Mexico. There's oil rigs everywhere. If you've ever gone up there uh, and gone offshore, if you look 360 degrees around you, you'll no joke probably see a dozen oil rigs. They're, they're that plentiful. Um, in this case, we were looking at sediments uh, on the shelf. We actually found some oil. Uh, this was two years after the oil spill. And then we looked at sediments in the slope. And in the slope, notice how different the color is. This is red versus um, not red. And here you have these clay, iron-rich minerals that are depositing. So it was a really cool environment. 
to uh, study iron processes. Notice here's an exercise bike and there's an oil rig in the background. Uh, I would go and exercise uh, on the deck every night and, you know, can you ask for a better environment while you're on a treadmill or, or on a, a stationary bike? Um, let me, uh, before I continue on, I'm going to get to the good stuff, things that will excite people. So here are, um, when I was over at Moat on the West Coast, we used these underwater drones, autonomous underwater vehicles. These are called buoyancy gliders. And these buoyancy gliders, they're, they're the new thing. I mean, everybody is using them in oceanography. And the reason is, is because they're almost completely autonomous. What you do is you send this thing out for basically three or five hours at a time. And it, you can direct it to different waypoints. What in the world? You can direct it to different waypoints. And it actually has a pump in its nose. And what it does is this pump will contract a little bit. And the glider, essentially the density gets higher. You fill this area up with water. And now the glider gets heavy. And when the glider gets heavy, if you look at my hand, the glider then sinks, it, it tilts down, and then as it tilts down, because it has wings, it also glides forward. Now there's an altimeter, and so it's constantly singing the, pinging the seafloor when it's on its way down, and when it recognizes that it's close to the bottom, it'll actually uh, push this pump back out and make it, and then some, and it'll make itself uh, positively buoyant. And so now it tilts back up, and now it travels back to the surface. So the whole time it's doing this zip, this, this sort of seesaw uh, pattern. We call them yo's, like a yo-yo. And um, it's traveling. And essentially it does all this by only driving this pump. And because of that, it's very, very, very um, power um, conservative. You conserve a lot of power just using this drive screw. So you can actually send this glider out for months at a time instead of propeller-driven drones in which they're only good for a day or two. So these surveys have really allowed you to um, study large swaths of the ocean um, you know, for a couple weeks at a time. And, and here you see off the west coast of Florida, this is a typical representation of the ocean. You consider this almost like a slice through the ocean, a two-dimensional slice. So here the glider is, is traveling up and down. Because the data density is so high, you don't really see it. But the glider is traveling up and down like this. And as it's doing that, it's going into deeper and deeper water until I eventually turn it around a few days. So this is a few day period right here. And now the glider heads back to shore. While it does that, I forgot to mention, it has a science bay here with a bunch of different sensors. So salinity, temperature, oxygen, CDOM, chlorophyll. And we are measuring things like salinity, chlorophyll A. And what you see here, you can, you can look at these large sort of mesoscale uh, ocean properties like salinity stratification here. Um, look at this upwelling region. Look how dense this salinity bottom water is by the end of the warm season. You have this region that's forming somewhere offshore here, and it's actually upwelling on depth, this high salinity water. And look, you have high chlorophyll confined to this high salinity region. So it's like you have some organism living there. In this case, we're hoping or we're trying to find our harmful algae bacteria, Florida red tide. It's residing in here. By December, you have some storms come through, wintertime mixing, and your entire water column is completely well mixed at this point. So this is just a, a, a neat way to look at the ocean. Uh, another here, in this case, here is basically what I just showed you is a routine transect as we travel west to deeper water, and then we come back east off the west coast of Florida here. And this is another reason why we use this because, hey, look, our glider is going west, west, west to deeper water. And then, whoa, look, there's nothing. We don't see much chlorophyll. And all of a sudden, we see a bunch of elevated chlorophyll. And so we say, oh, my gosh, what is that? So we actually went out 
and we surveyed this spot. When we went out, we went out on a boat and we took water samples from these locations. And sure enough, we were able to find out that this chlorophyll patch was in fact due to a specific species uh, of Karenia. It wasn't Karenia brevis, the Florida red tide species, but it was some other species in its same family or its same genus. So we said, well, what is that? And we figured, well, maybe it has something to do, maybe priming the ocean conditions for this algae bloom. Maybe this is the last thing I'll talk about. Um, when I, we have this, this problem. So here you go. If you look at the depth of your glider, of your buoyancy glider, your AUV, over time, you see it's going up and down, and then something happens. The glider can't get past a certain um, density gradient. And now, all of a sudden, something else happens, and now your glider's stuck on the seafloor. It occasionally can get up a little bit, but it's stuck on the seafloor. And you don't hear from it. Notice this entire time, like six or eight hours pass, and we haven't heard from our glider until eventually it has to blow an emergency ejection weight that's 500 grams buoyant, and then it can finally surface and it calls home, but we have to go pick it up at that point because it blew its ejection rate. The whole reason is because of remora, these sucker fish that you may have seen, they stick onto whale sharks. I think you have lampreys in the Great Lakes, which are kind of similar. But um, essentially when I started in my lab over on the West Coast, I didn't, um, I, I opened up, there wasn't much, let's just say there wasn't much uh, knowledge transfer since my predecessor had quit before I arrived. And so I opened up a storage locker and I found uh, zip ties, duct tape, um, women's pantyhose, uh, Vaseline, and hot sauce. And, you know, I said, what in the world are these people up to? What have they been doing? And sure enough, they were actually all um, repellent mechanisms, deterrent mechanisms for remoras. You could make a mixture of hot sauce and Vaseline and coat it on a glider in hopes that it would keep a remora off. Uh, essentially that stuff didn't work. So what we ended up doing that kind of works is we put a uh, scuba tank mesh over it. And for the most part it keeps the remoras from being able to stick, but it's not 100% effective. Um, so I do have a new grant to actually try and functionalize the surface of this glider to keep um, to keep the, the remora away. So obviously I don't have time to talk about this stuff, so I'll just talk about um, my new lab, which I can't wait to start ordering supplies today now that all the proposals and, and this talk are finished. Now I can finally get busy in my new lab. And I just wanted to give you some unsolicited advice, which is, I love when people give me unsolicited advice. It's my favorite <laughs> thing ever. But uh, I really urge you to get involved in undergraduate research. Even if you don't have the best grades, um, just ask. Look up a faculty member on their website and ask them if they have any uh, project. If, if, you know, if, if you demonstrate an interest in their research, most of the times, especially if they're a younger faculty member, I would say that they would be happy to have you working in their lab. They might even offer you to, to pay you. Uh, chemical oceanographers are highly sought after in industry. And because it's mostly because we're improvising at sea and, and we work hard. Uh, and finally, and, and also because of all of our interdisciplinary knowledge. And uh, even if you're not an environmental science major and you're just taking this class for fun, uh, consider going to graduate school, even just for a master's degree in, in oceanography. Because, I, because it's so multidisciplinary, um, you know, you might actually uh, be a good candidate and you, who knows, you might bring a, a cool new perspective to the field. So with that, I'll just uh, stop and, 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 yeah, bring it on. Questions? All right. So we thank you very much, Jordan. Thank, thank you so much for this fantastic overview.